Like newsletters, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I, I do not do the marketing myself, so I don't know. But okay. <laughs> Whenever we go live, are you okay wearing a little mic? I guess. Um, it'll help pick it up for like, the live. So you could either like clip this wherever, um, or we could do like a little mic if you want to, like on your sweater like that. If that's okay. I think the mic helps. Um, I'll wait to hand it off to you because we're like live, but like calming down right now.
And then like that on your like charging. And then we're at seven like o'clock. So we're ready to go live. Okay. So um, I'll go up front and announce and then I'll introduce you. Okay. Thank you. Um, wow, I'm nervous. I've never talked this much about my stuff on film and camera, and, like being streamed through. But I'm Sarah Simmons. I'm really, I'm really happy to be here and have so much of my work upstairs on display together, and then be able to talk about it down here. Um, I got to put together this slideshow of older work, newer work, and then my book garden project, which some of you guys might know about or might not know about. Um, but I, I chose this not cake picture. This piece, this is not cake number three, because it kind of has everything that I do in it. It's got paper, it's got some words on there, it's got sewing, I've got little bits of fiber in here, and reclaimed trim, and then it's got recycled packaging, and, um, and it's got an extra meaning. So it looks very cute and pretty, but it really, it's, it's the UN report on um, women's rights from 1976, I think. I don't remember what year. Um, so it's all the things that really aren't that easy to eat, that, you know, things that needed to improve, that maybe have improved, some things that haven't improved. That's what I like to do. I make, like to make things that look kind of pretty and then um, have a little extra meaning to them, which you'll notice upstairs. So my clicker doesn't really work. I'm going to, like, pretend to click it. <laughs> and so this is some older work, and I'm 47. It took me a little bit of time to get, like, where I'm at with this. This is work that I did in college, and if I go back to my childhood, I was always super driven by books and words. I made these little puzzle books called the Bear Puzzle Books, and I'd make like word searches and crossword puzzles and logic puzzles, and then I'd take like peanuts and fabric, and I'd make like little peanut people and little houses, and it was always just I just wanted to make things. I never really felt like I was really good at drawing. wasn't really into like painting. Didn't do those traditional art things that I felt like I was supposed to do if I was really like an artist. Um, so then I got to the point where I went to college, and so I went for metalsmithing because it seemed like I could do a lot of things with that. It was kind of practical, but I could also do other things. I could incorporate other materials like 
leather. This is actually a leather band off of a shoe. So obviously I was like reclaiming materials then. Um, making little tiny books, doing things that light up like this little flashlight down here. Um, taking inspiration from books. This is all a bunch of different knots, which is, um, I kind of took that from the shipping news, if you guys know that, that book. So this idea of using different knots to introduce an entire, each chapter. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take knots to represent all these different things in my life? So always using different materials and representa representing things. So that's some of my older work in college. And then like I graduated and I was working retail and a lot and then getting married and then having kids. And the next thing I know, like I'm not making anything because there's no time to make anything. But I feel like if I'm making something, I have to, it has to make money, right? So I have to be, it has to be like another job I can do. And so I was a retail manager for like 10 years. And it wasn't bad, it was decent and busy. Um, but I thought like, well, how can I make some money at my art, right? So I started working with books that were discarded and making jewelry and taking like fabric that was discarded or other garments and turning them into bags. But it really wasn't going anywhere and it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but it got me sewing and it got me folding paper. Um, this was like 2012 or so. So I got to quit my job and stay home with the kids because my kids were like two and five and my husband was traveling all the time and daycare is like a mortgage and it just didn't make sense for me to be working and him to be traveling. and. So uh, I started trying to like figure out what I was gonna do. So this was kind of like one of my first bit things that I did. This is um, a little table and actually this paper. Somebody, we bought, a, we bought a shack of a house and in the basement there was a lot of books and other materials. Um, so I started taking <coughs> apart some of those books. So it's kind of one of the first times I took apart books, started doing other things with them. Yeah. Um, could you stand on that side? That side? Yeah. When I'm blocking it, is this better? Awesome. Okay. And we'll click through. All right. So I started working with paper more and thinking about these are some terrible pictures because I had a really terrible camera phone at that point. Um, but you might recognize this piece. This piece is upstairs. But when I first made it, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it, how I was going to display it. So I made like this weird little hanger thing. And I was playing around with cake once again. And this is cake roulette. You can spin it. It's got lights inside. Um, Anyway, so that was kind of the beginnings of those things. And then I met Ran Ran Randy Morgan here, and she was doing the display cases at Stickley Library. And she said, I'd like to show your stuff there. So also terrible old pictures. But I had started working more with dictionary. These are like dictionary pieces. They're little, oh, okay. And did my first like book deconstruction. This is Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood. She's my favorite. I like her writing. It's not a huge Handmaid's Tale fan. It, it's okay. But Cat's Eye was my favorite. Um, and so I took a, every single page from that book and turned this into this dress. And I was thinking about how words impact us over time, how they change over time, how sometimes when we're, you know, we use them as protection, right? So it's something that you read and it makes you look at something differently or think about something differently. And then you, you use that to like, you know, help your soul later on or how you can use them, you know, sending words out to other people, either in good ways or bad ways. Um, and this piece on the left was probably one of my first book deconstructions. And it's actually um, how to read better. And at this point in time, I was getting my son diagnosed with dyslexia. I didn't know why he wasn't reading. I mean, come on, I read to him all the time. See, yeah, I'm like super book oriented, right? We're reading all the time and my kid wasn't reading. And um, so I learned about dyslexia in that time period too. And that was kind of really life changing um, for all of us, I think. So more cake, uh, did, more cake. This is not cake. This is actually the, I guess the first not cake. So these are civil war maps and um, there's different words on there and it's things that once again, it looks pretty and fun, but really it's, it's difficult topics and maps are also things that maps and they spin. This one, you can't move it. I made it so you can't, it's stuck. This one's very movable. So I like things that move. I like using reclaimed materials. Um, What's next? And then I really started sewing a lot. I also work at, I work at Moon Public Library and I've been there for about 10 years. And one thing I discovered working at a public library is that there's books that get discarded. They're either, they're out of date, they're damaged, nobody's circulating them anymore. So at first it kind of broke my heart, right? It breaks your heart like, oh, look at these books, nobody wants them. And then I started thinking about, well, you know, practically, we can't keep all these things. Information changes. 
new additions are made, things fall apart. And I started thinking about how I could reuse these materials and use books more. So one of the things I was doing was reclaiming different parts out of books and sewing them together. Then I got to do this really fun thing. This is actually right over there in Sweetwater. And it was like a reuse festival. It was like the reuse festival was going on in Pittsburgh. I got to build that whole bunch of junk in the middle of the floor here. And then there were four of us artists who were then challenged to build something out of it. I don't know if anybody was here for that once upon a time, <laughs> but it was really fun. And it really, um, I remember I took this wheelbarrow and I took this punching bag and someone that night commented like, wow, that was really bold to take these things that are so imbued with um, meaning already. So you're taking a punching bag, which really has a lot of meaning in this wheelbarrow and they're red and it's to take these objects that already have their own meaning imbued and then trying to turn it into something else, which is something I think I've really gotten better at doing since then. And I found that that's something that I really like to do is taking objects that already have some meaning that you get when you look at them and then twisting it just a little bit or letting you, if you want to, just see it as that. You can see it as that, but if you look a little bit more, you see it differently. On the left, um, that's me and a lot of photographs from my book garden, which I'll talk, talk about later. Library again. So I work at the library when I get to make these really fun creations out of paper. Usually it's discarded paper or discarded books. Um, this was a Venus flytrap that I made. There's little flies and there's the book return. So then I really started working on these dresses. So you saw the first one where I didn't really know what I was doing. I was cutting out all these little pieces and pages from her book and making it into like this thing that I thought maybe was going to be worn. And somewhere along the line, I kind of decided it didn't matter if it was going to be worn. These are really more, I guess, sculptural pieces. Um, and they're driven by just materials on hand. This one has called um, Cultivating Vocabulary and it's all dictionary. Dictionary pages on her legs, dictionary pieces on the skirt. Wearing language, how do we use language? Always thinking about language. The one on the left is called Package Beauty. And that has a whole bunch of um, those orange things that says packing slip enclosed. Like when you're getting all your packages now from Amazon. I got a whole box of those at the thrift store. And thinking, and at that point I was thinking about fast fashion and it wasn't even, this was like 2018. So it wasn't even like the height of like everybody's ordering everything. We were ordering a lot of stuff. I thought we were ordering a lot of things, but not like we are now. And you know, Shine didn't even exist at that point, right? So, but it was about these, you know, getting clothing in the mail, what's disposable, how are we, how, how, how are we thinking about clothing and I guess also, you know, online ordering too. Um, so just a few more of my dresses. Some of these you'll recognize from upstairs. So there's this one and that one. Those two are both upstairs. This one was in one of the prior pictures. So I've done even more garments than is even exhibited up here. Um, and then the picture on the left, you really see it, but this dress kind of morphed over the years into the piece that's in the corner. So I don't even think of my pieces necessarily as being permanent as they are. Everything is changing. They might not need to exist that way in a couple years. Um, I like the idea of these being ephemeral. They're not gonna last forever. They're not gonna necessarily be in the same state forever. Uh, I might not wanna show them again in a few years. I don't know. Or well, they might change as they are. Some of them, obviously, I don't think I'm gonna do anything to. Like, they're, they're good. They're perfect as they are. Probably gonna keep them as they are. Um, but sometimes I like the idea of them being fluid and being able to change over time. So, I, at this point, this is like 2018. I had this other project, this book garden project going on, which I haven't talked about yet, but it was really influencing what I was doing and thinking about growth, thinking about nature. Um, these are little seed pods with beads. There's, you know, I've got like this, what is that tool? Garden tools that I was using, thinking about cultivating and a lot of thoughts about like motherhood and how we grow our children, how we grow, how we, how we use words too to help, help, help people develop and how to, you know, words can help, words can hurt, how they're very important, like how the language we use is very important. And then I threw in a few more things where I'm just continuing to collect words and collect debris. Um, this piece is called, um, 
it with your words. And there's actually a little dictionary that comes with it, and it's the dictionary of shared words. It actually spent some time, I think I first made it for an exhibit here where we had a bunch of installations throughout Sweetwater. And if you visited, you could sit on the bench, which has a bunch of dictionaries at the bottom that you could pull out and look at. And you could add a word you feel like is important for other people to know, that one that word that you'd like to share. So it's still kind of, the dictionary of shared words is still growing. I have some ideas of when I'd like to bring it back out again. I'd like to be able to collect some more words in it. Um, and the piece on the left is called Amend. And those are actually, they are all pieces of flags that I collected from the ground in my local cemetery. So I started walking through my local cemetery in 2020 when it was shut down and wasn't really going anywhere and started walking through and I noticed like all these flag scraps and little tiny flowers, you know, all the little artificial flowers all over the ground. So I started just collecting them and bringing them home and washing them. I didn't really know what I was going to do with them. Um, and then, so this, I ended up kind of composite, getting a lot of them together to make this piece of mend. And I just keep doing more dresses. <laughs> and a lot, so a lot of times I'm finding metal butcher's apron. Um, this is a lot of denim. It's like, I don't know, six pairs of denim pants or something. I sewed them into little pockets. And then more of the flags from the cemetery and more flowers from the cemetery. So I kind of like, I was doing all these collections of things during COVID and sewing, and then I was getting stuck on some work. And I, another artist ended up reaching out to me and wanted to collaborate. And uh, with, his name is Evan Rumble. And so we did these couple of COVID collaborations, which was really a nice way to get like out of a rut and do something completely different, where these are little paper masks that are sewn, and we had face shields with text on them. So I never collaborated in, with anybody before. I don't feel like I work very well with others, but we were able to um, separate it. So we each had a job, like we figured it out together. He did this, I did that, we put it together. It was good. So it wasn't actually, we didn't even meet until the day we put these pieces together. Everything was done through like a text collaboration over about seven days. And then we got together, and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to go meet this stranger, and we're going to make some art. And then we did it, and there it was. So, so that kind of got me out of a creative funk. And the next thing I knew, my husband had COVID, and we weren't leaving the house because it was like early 20, no, it was 2021, 2022. I don't know. I can't remember now. Anyway, they all kind of blurred. Does everybody feel that way? Like the last few years of just like, what year was that? Was that 2020, 2021? I don't know. Anyway, I had this time when I wasn't leaving the house for like a whole bunch of days in a row, and I had gotten an entire box of paper dolls from, I have to give a shout out to Ray down at Emma Jeans in Coriopolis because I get a lot of my stuff from him, like the metal butcher's apron and wooden crutches, all kinds of stuff. So I had this box of paper dolls, and I thought, how fun to incorporate nursery rhymes with these paper dolls and to take these silhouettes and pull these women out of a place, put them in a different place, stitch around them, give them like a different way to tell these stories. So I actually have a bunch of those here with me. So I got, I got a little manic and like hyper-focused and I made like, I don't know, how many did I make? Like 30 of them, all these different, um, with the nursery rhymes, the mother goose and the paper dolls last year. And then they kind of continued with more. This is with fabric and stitching. Uh, it says, hold my hand, we can do this together. And um, it's a whole bunch of women holding hands. It's a long stretch. And then I kind of got into these houses too. Once again, pulling out these silhouettes for the top and the inside and using more of the paper dolls and the text from the mother goose, which I liked being able to take these, these, these nursery rhymes that we all know or maybe know. I don't know if anybody knows them anymore. Um, some of them aren't very relevant. Some of them are really like interesting. If you read them as an adult, you're like, wow. Um, I did not see that when I was, you know, six or five. Um, and just using these words and creating these little houses that could open up and change and actually adding other, other text into them too. So I think I made even more. Even more of these little doll houses. I may make some more too. We'll see. So this kind of brings us up to where we're at this year. Um, 
I use a lot of diaries in my work, some diaries. This diary is actually mine from my high school year, my senior year of high school and through college. A couple of the other pieces up there are also made from diaries of strangers that I've been able to acquire over the years, which is kind of fun to be able to read somebody else's words and then be able to take those words and put them into to a new piece and kind of reframe them. So I was working on this one, and I'd made all those paper, paper dolls, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to just make like a little portrait of this piece that I'm working on? So here's my like sculptural dress, and then maybe I take some of my words and make myself a little portrait. So I thought, well, that was fun. I want to do that again. So I did it a whole bunch of times, and I started pulling out old work. So I just saw like the cookbook piece. I started in 2014, probably put it, and I put it into that frame of how it is in 2016. And I thought, well, it would be nice to give it a portrait, right? See how she's changed, and I've got it documented. Um, so I kind of went through all of them. I have no idea what the next slide is. Is it still like, okay, so I did, I put all these portraits in here, and I thought maybe, I don't know if some of you guys went upstairs, if you had questions about any of the pieces, if anybody wanted to ask me about any of them, or if I could should just like walk through and tell you like a little bit about what I was thinking. Sure, we'll just talk about what I was thinking. So um, this one is cost form, and if you look at her up there, she's got all these little tags all over her, and they say things like freedom, environment, beauty, and it's all these things, what are you willing to pay? Like, what is the cost of that convenience that you want? Uh, how much is it costing our environment? How much is it costing, you know, what is the really the true cost? Oh, it's $10, but, you know, if I spent 50, would that go further? And it would it maybe not hurt this or not hurt, you know, or how much does that work? Or am I, you know, am I su supporting? Is it, like, I'm thinking about environment. I'm thinking about beauty. I'm thinking about all the things that you trade on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe not even money, but all those things that you're, I don't know, exchanging. Um, this one's called Ringer, and I would probably, if I, would, she's older, and I'd probably put more stitching to her if I could go back and redo it, but I don't think I will at this point. But um, she's got a lot of anxiety, she's got panic, she's got worry, she's being put through it all, and I really like this idea of these couple groups of like women doing these like women's chores, like women's work. And you know we're working, we're cleaning, we're also worrying about what's happening to the kids. We're worrying about their education. We're worrying about like the house. We're worrying about the bills. We've got panic. We've got you know all these things that are just churning around. Um, textbook sexuality was kind of a fun piece that I did pretty early on too, and thinking about just expectations of beauty and girls, and it'd go across the top. It's you know sugar and spice and everything nice. And uh, when my friend's kids pointed out that spice was really big, and they liked that, that I made the spice big, and I never really thought about it. It's nice and small, spice is really big. Under her skirt, she's got these ability to do everything, but that's not what people are looking for, you know, that's, that's hidden. Um, and then the one at the end is called Sink, and it was a diary of a stranger, and it was a really, really, really sad diary. Um, she had this terrible relationship she always thought was going to get better. It never got better. It always got worse. She lost her father. The relationship just, and then at the end, I, fig I kind of figured out who she was by some of the, and, I, and she had passed away. So not only did she lose, like, her dad, she lost her partner. She ended up passing away. So it was just this really sad, and I was thinking about this thinking, thinking down. She was just um, Blossom also came from a diary. These two both came from actually the same diary. And I don't know who this woman was, but she was a really prolific writer. She wrote a lot of stuff. And this one, she was always, she was always talking about like how she felt like she wasn't protected when she was a little girl. And she just, she, she just mourned this little girl who wasn't protected. So I kind of wanted to make this little girl kind of fluffy, like little girl dress, like really like springtime and it's blossoming. And, um, but then if you look closely, you see a lot of like, the upset with her words and um, that it's not necessarily as sweet as what she had wanted it to be. Um, the next piece, too, is um, called Form. And originally it was two pieces, and it just didn't really work for me. And I couldn't figure out why. I showed it at like twice and in separate places, and it just wasn't. So I combined them into one, and then I felt like it really finally worked. So the outside part is real curly. It's got like, it looks like wooly. I always think of like wooly, sheepy, like it's like fluffy. It's like protection and it's like, it looks nice and soft and it's what you want to show to the world. And if you peek on the inside, there's lots of very 
the vulnerable things. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of things that she's not conveying. And then she's got all these words that are just like dragging her down and just all the baggage and all the things that she's carrying around with her. Um, resting on my hips is literally like it's a cookbook. <laughs> it's a cookbook and it's wearable. It's got a little magnet. And um, thinking about like food and eating and feeding your family and what are you feeding them and how are you feeding them and what, um, you know, are you eating too much? Why did you gain weight? And like all these things playing into it. And then she's got this little gun ball kind of like um, juggling act she's doing. Um, and Polished Off is on the end. That's the one with all the nail polish. And that started with a collection of bottles of nail polish that I wasn't wearing anymore. I don't wear nail polish anymore. I'm thinking about the, um, I guess the physical effects of nail polish, right? So they were talking about like what's in it. It's like formaldehyde and like all this other stuff that didn't get absorbed in your body and then thinking about like making them and thinking about the people who work in like nail salons and like the fumes that they're exposed to and thinking about what is it costing them? What is it costing us? And this beauty, beauty expectations, what are the costs of these things? Um, go to the next one. So these are the last three. And I realized I never actually took good pictures of these two either. I just took like little snapshots. Um, so one on the end is flesh and blood, and that's an older piece. And it's a, obviously a play on like youth and aging. And you know, she's got this young like bridesmaid's dress that she's wearing, and then she's got all of these, she still has all the physical components that she's gonna have as she ages, and they're going to age, she's going to age. And so the, and underneath, if you look at her stand, she's got like the little four legged cane, which has a special, has a name. I don't remember what it is now, but it's like a four, a little four legged walker that she's got. Um, the next one is in the corner up there too. It was the one that started on a wall and then it kind of became its own thing. And it's um, incubation and it's, it's one of those pieces that's dictionary driven and word driven kind of about what, how we use words, how we use words to help, you know, raise our kids, to help connect with people, how we use words to, to either nurture or to not nurture. Um, and then this last one here is breathe, and that's the gumball machine one, which is workable. If you guys go up, you can definitely turn the knob. Don't put a quarter in, just turn it to the right, and eventually one will drop. So you kind of have to like relax and just wait for it to happen. It's not as um, regulated as you would think. So it was really my reminder to breathe and remember how to breathe. And interesting enough, like I had people comment like, oh, it's about like women's fashion and how constraining it is. And I was like, that's really brilliant. I think it is. Like, so I really like hearing other people's takes on what they, what they get out of the work. Sometimes it's different than what I originally intended. Or I realized maybe I did intend that, but I wasn't really thinking about it completely. So that's kind of the end of everything that's up there. And so I have this other project. Does anybody have questions? Should I just move into my book garden? Am I just rambling too fast? Oh, it's OK. Um, so I have this book garden project, which I started in 2016. Do any of you guys know any scoops on maybe? I know a bunch of you do know about it. Um, and it, going back to the library where, you know, there's books that get tossed, right? So the information's no good. A lot of it's out of date nonfiction. It's damaged. It's whatever. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if I stacked a bunch of these in my yard and maybe planted some stuff and just saw what happened. I tried to, I did some searches to see if anybody had been doing this. And the only thing I could find was this garden in France where they stacked a bunch and then they cut out parts and they put um, mushroom spores in to grow mushrooms. I'm not a big mushroom fan, so I wasn't going to do that. But, um, and I thought, well, I don't, and I couldn't see what happened to it after about a year. So I was like, well, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's just see. So I started with, I think, 800 books. Oh, this is where I actually really walk through the whole thing. Um, so September 28, 2016, I had about 800 books. You can click through. And it kind of looks like a mess. So there used to be an above ground pool here that we had taken out. And so it was this flat, like sandy area where not a whole lot was growing. And I just thought, well, I'm going to stack a whole bunch of books. And we had all these rounds from these hemlock trees that had been taken down. So I rolled those down the hill and stacked those. And I thought, like, I'll just wait and see what happens. I'm going to go take some pictures. And so I would, you know, I had the hemlock, there we go, I had the hemlock pieces. So I was kind of an experiment, decay and change, just to see what would happen over time. So they started curling. Um, paperbacks did different things than what hardbacks did. A lot of these I put in, and then I put some dirt around them. I planted a lot of bulbs 
There's not a lot of the bulbs left. Most of them got eaten. There's like some daffodils. There's a little bit of, um, that's really kind of about it. There's a few other things that pop up too. But I have a lot of like native plants that are starting to really kind of take over. Um, I was so excited the first time it rained. It was kind of ridiculous. I was like, it's raining. I wonder what it looks like in the rain. So I was like running down there to see. I'm like, oh, it's dark out. Let me go take a picture in the dark and see what it looks like. So I was going out and my whole thing was just to take pictures every day and I was just using my phone. So I had rules for myself that I would not move anything. I would not stage anything. I would just document what I was seeing. And I was only going to use my phone. I was just going to, you know, just, uh, just, just experiment. So my mom was a science teacher. My dad's a science well, an engineer. And so a lot of our, like, growing up was really, we would go camping and we'd collect specimens for her to show in class. We'd go to the beach. We were collecting shells and take specimens for her to show in class. So I was kind of like a little tribute of my own little science experiment of art, art and science in my backyard. And she thought it was a little bizarre because she was, she was still alive when I started it. But she was like, oh, I don't think art and science really go together, she said. <laughs> and I said, I think they really do. Um, so I don't know what comes next. So, you know, and then the deer would come through. And like I left them pumpkins. So of course they knocked books over. And so year one, like, I've got a lot of pokeweed that comes up in there now, and a lot of goldenrod, um, poison ivy. And then it got cold, and this is so exciting. So I was really excited when you see like the frost coming out, and I think I've got maybe some really, and then the snow. I was like, it's snowing, let me take some more pictures. And look, and then I had this weird little ice, po ice flow that would start here. This is where like the, it was like real sandy, like nothing was growing, and the water would collect, and it would just freeze over. So this is the same round. So you can see on the left and then in the winter time and how the books kind of like popped out. So I got these really great hoarfrost. And so even now I get excited when it's like the right temperature and there's enough moisture in the air because it has to be just right and you get these big spiky crystal growths coming out of the books. And snow. It was really exciting when the snow came. And there was more snow. So I kept taking more pictures of snow. And then I almost lost my mind the first time I saw mushrooms growing. I don't really like to eat mushrooms. And I don't think I, these are cup fungus. So now I start looking them up to find out what they are, and I won't eat them anyway. But, um, but I was so excited the first year I had mushrooms. I was like, there's mushrooms. Like, my, I'm like, Aaron, there's mushrooms in there. This is what I've been waiting for. And he's like, OK. <laughs> and um, so there's more of them, and spider webs. And so I was always looking for little insects that were in there. And who can I find? Um, slime mold. I get a lot of slime mold showing up when it's just right. And these lovely little slugs. Aren't they super, they're super cute. I think they're really cute. So different times of the year, I'll find a whole bunch of slugs, or sometimes I find snails. Look how cute he is. He's adorable. <laughs> and it's just like, the one, the one time I went out, it was like a whole bunch of them must have been born like within a couple days, because they were just everywhere, and these cute, tiny slugs. And then spiders. Um, oh, and there's a snail. Super exciting. And another snail. And I got some really good snails this year, and just different mushrooms that have shown up in different places. This is actually my kid's foot. And he was... Um, It would have been like nine. And so his foot is not that big. But these are like these little tiny mushrooms. I don't remember what they are called. But I did I do research to try and figure out what all the things are that I find in there. And then more mushrooms. I was really excited. And then we have lots of strawberry runners that come up. And the berries. And then the little animals come and eat them. And I had mantis. This guy was like, we did a whole photo shoot for like a half an hour. And he was just like. And then the second year run around. And you can see like the covers start to decay. And I, it was really exciting the first few years because I really didn't know what was going to happen with it. Um, and as the text starts to wear away, and then the pa inside pages start to like crunch together and separate out, and then just random, oh, aster, I get a lot of aster. I like it in the fall, they just like explode everywhere. Um, and then I had that, oh, look, and there's my little Elliot when he was small too. And they had these books that were under the water that for a while. So kind of out of the book garden, I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I could do something with books that could be in a sculpture that I could take someplace else, right? Because this thing is stuck in my yard, all these books. I can't move them. It's just I'm photographing them. I'm documenting them. And so we had this opportunity to exhibit at Ogilvy in their Bissonette Gardens. And I thought, I'm going to make this book bed and <laughs> just see what it is. And thinking about like reading in bed, like who read in bed when you were little? Right? Or still reads in bed now. Or like your mom read to bed, in bed, or your dad, or your grandma, or whatever. Like all these lovely memories of reading in bed with books. So 
I thought I'll make this book bed. So I did this in 2017. And now it's still in the book garden and in the snow. And now it's 17, 18, 19. It's coming up on six years old, and it's still going. It's still there. Um, yeah, there were apples. So sometimes I'll leave little offerings on the book bed. I'll put pumpkins down there. I put little apples down there. We have like a whole herd of deer that come and sleep in our yard. Um, so year two, just more frost, more fungus. Oh, there's the deer. These guys still come and sleep in the yard. It's really kind of ugly if you see the whole thing. But you can see the book bed that was in there. Still in there on the side. Um, let's see. Oh, and these little white spots are actually little fungus fungus that's growing on the on the books. And other plants come in and oh yeah. And so I like looking for words. I'll go hunting for text. Um, and there's some books that I've been photographing for years now. I have one that's a handbook on caregiving that I've been photographing for probably three years now, and I just keep checking on it and photographing it and watching it kind of decay and just looking at just the different way it gets modeled. Um, and then I thought it was interesting. I'd put some rocks on some of the books and how as the covers wear away, the paper kind of just like swings back up and gets stuck on there. I found this book as mother daughter and I kind of photographed it. I think there's like a daughter without mother. Did I put that one in on the next slide? No, maybe I didn't. But it was apt for that year. So but just different changes that happen in the paper. And more text. And like these are like the edges of the pages kind of wearing away. And then how sometimes you can see right side and sometimes it's like blended through and you're seeing the back side of the text or part of it is gone. It's just really fascinating. And then I got a lot of turkey tail, which is this little stuff down here. And there's more turkey tail. And there's more turkey tail under the book. And more turkey tail. It's really exciting. So I found that certain things grow at certain rates of decay. So when certain the books are at a certain place, certain things are growing. When the hemlock was decaying, certain other things are growing. This year I've got all these little, um, what are they called? British soldiers? These little British soldier fungi, which are really cool. It must be like just the right state of decay for those to show up everywhere. And just the way the different pages would. And just finding titles like aging. Is kind of fun. So I kind of I did a lot of thinking about this is more slime mold, um, and the way this this is dockweed and how it like changes color, goes all bright red, and then there's holes and you can see through it. I really think it's pretty. Um, I'm just finding like just just the juxtaposition. Like I said, like I did not arrange any of these. These were all just as I found them, as I hunted them down and looked for them. So you know, you can take that as it is. And I digest. This is a whole bunch of like body systems, I think, in this book, and how some parts of the, the covers will be left and the rest will be just starting to go just completely gray and white, and little ants. So I got to make a second book bed this year, well, last year, and it was at Bridgeville Public Library, so it was book Bedtime Stories Volume 2, and it was there for about 10 months. I just took it down, and I'm going to be making Bedtime Stories Volume 3, and it's going to be at the Botanic Gardens, and it'll be mid-June through, like, October. So I saved all of the wood and the framing from this, from this volume, and I'm going to repaint it. Um, and then I'm going to put new books, in, new old books in it. So these books have all been added to the book garden. And so I'm going to start fresh in mid-July with some new discarded books and freshly painted setup. So yeah, I use porch columns. These are actually from our shack that we renovated, and I'd saved these in the basement for six or seven years, and my husband's like, when are you going to use those? I'm like, I'll use those. One of these days I'm going to use them. So I hauled them out and I used those for that. So this was one of my first experiments that I did to wonder like, what it would look like if I put books at the top of a post for those book beds. And so this is what it started like in 2017, and that's how it was going last year. And it's still there now. So I had to do planning. I don't know, I put extra planning bits in there. I'm building it, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. They are, I use like um, rods, steel rods, like threaded rods through the center. So I drilled all the books and stuck that through, and then they're on each end. So I grew some sweet peas at the book bed because I thought it'd be fun to have like Princess and the Pea 
do a little story time. Oh, and this little guy is super cute. Little jumping spider. So yeah, there's lots of spiders. The spiders loved that bed. It was um, under a lot of trees, and so it kind of aged differently than the one that's in my book garden. This one stayed a little more wet, I guess, and it had a lot more spiders in it. The one in my book garden is very, like, it's in the sun. It's very dry. Um, and I like just the observations of the same slime mold over, like, three days. Just how it changes and, like, how the water affects it. So, I mean, I could go forever. This is bird's nest fungus. Plants growing out of books. It just goes on and on. More plants growing out of books. And more plants growing out of books. But they never make it very long. They'll go, come up a little bit, and then there's just no more, there's not the right nutrients for it to, to continue. Um, just more of a text. So, and pollinators. Ah, so there it is. Like, see, so this was its current view actually as of last summer. It's not its current view right now, obviously. It's not. <laughs> It's not grown up that way, but there's a lot of pokeweed. I've got some, a black locust tree that's growing in there. There's a walnut tree growing. There's an apple tree growing. There's a lot of mint, which I probably shouldn't have let grow, but it is in there. Goldrod, aster, dockweed, um, Queen Anne's lace, and there's some spots of poison ivy, which the deer come around and they eat periodically. So I kind of, it's just kind of a, kind of a mess. It's not that pretty when you look at the whole thing, I guess, but I like all the little individual bits. And for its sixth birthday, I added a whole bunch of books this past September. I added another round of books. And now that I know kind of what happens, I'm documenting them differently. I'm also allowing myself to alter things and change things and dig things up that I want to see if I want to see what it looks like. So just some of the stuff before. The space? Probably like, probably like to that wall and around. And it's a hillside. There's kind of a hillside it goes up. So this is like the top of a hill and it goes down. So it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's like big. And then the worst part is, is our neighbors had um, a whole bunch of the um, hemlock, which has the big blight right now. Is there hemlock? No, it's not the ash borer, but it's um, it's another blight that's happening with um, that they're they're conifers, they're and that's so we had they lost a whole bunch of their trees, so now it's very exposed. We're gonna have to plant a lot more trees in there. So anyway, yeah, six. Oh yeah, I did. I put pictures into this. I forgot. <laughs> Sixth birthday, I put in a whole bunch of pictures of this new uh, stock of books. So. See, a lot of those rounds you can't see anymore. And there's this little tiny piece of book plastic wrap that I was photographing for a while, but now it's kind of come undone. So it was fun to photograph it for a while and just watching, like, the bleed. Oh, and this, these guys were great. I got some snails. Some more snails. So, yeah. That's the last one. Yeah, I didn't update any book garden pictures from when I put this together, but... Just let what happens happen. I might go in and like do a little weed waxing this year. I started making some pathways and laying down stone, just like potato stones, like those big chunky rocks, and um, just so I have a little place to walk around in there. And the deer like make little paths and they'll be bedded down in certain places. But any questions, comments? Did I talk too much? I don't think the deer read them, but they do knock them over sometimes. And um, yeah, it's funny. There's a whole herd that kind of, they'll come and they'll spend the night in the, our backyard. So a lot of them were born in the neighbor's side yard. It's kind of, we've got like a nice kind of isolated area where we live. So it's kind of nice on a dead end street. I don't know. I guess I'm going to keep doing it. And um, I was kind of, I don't really know what I was had in mind with it. I was like, I don't know what my goal was with this. It was kind of just an experiment. I wanted to document and see what happened. And so another artist had challenged me. She said, you know, Sarah, think about like how it makes you feel. And if you write about how it makes you feel, that's going to help you understand what you're doing with it and how I feel about it. And, and I, so I wrote a whole new description of the book garden. And then it kind of made me think about my other work and how it all ties together, that really it's, it's this untapped potential and things that are going to be thrown away. 
So I see these, I see like there's another option for it. It doesn't have to be discarded. We can do something else with it. So it, I mean, it leads to problems because you start keeping too many things, but you know, just seeing this untapped potential and wanting to really like give it an extra life and like let it age and let it transform into something else. Even though, you know, everybody thought it's useful life was over with, it's got something else left. And that's kind of the same way I feel about a lot of the materials that I use in, in what I'm in what I make too. So kind of all ties together a little bit. We also have questions. Not every day, but sometimes I do. Like there'll be I'll have like stretches where I'm down there like every day all the time. And then certain times of year, like not much happens. So I'm not necessarily down there as much. Like in the middle of summer, when it's really dry and it's really hot, there's not a whole lot of change happening. When it's really wet in the spring and the fall, sometimes there'll be like, you don't even know what mushrooms are gonna pop up or like what's gonna start growing on something. And it won't be there two days later. It's like the slime mold. So different times of the year, I'm down there a lot more. And if I realize I haven't been down there, I've then I realize I miss it. So it's kind of just a little, I'm trying to make it like a little place I go and meditate a little bit too. I guess go down there and just think. So it was this weird, it was like, I didn't have, when I was working full time and I was like a manager and I was like 45 hours a week and like I just didn't have much of me left to do any of it, right? And I was just tired and you know, everything's left for the kids. And then I have, and I never felt like I could take a break from working to do my art. But then once we got to the point where it didn't make sense to be putting them in daycare and my husband traveling and I got to just kind of, and I quit working it was like vacation every day. And so I think we went, I don't know, like maybe the first year I didn't do a whole lot, maybe the first six months I didn't, but the next thing I knew like, you know, like we're painting every day. We're like making a mess every day. We're building whatever outside. My kids have a big mud pit when they were little and you know, we're just doing all these things and it really just was able to help me open up my creativity, I guess, and let me, and then I had had this time where I could do these things. Um, not necessarily when they napped, because it was like literally as soon as I quit working, my youngest stopped napping and figured out how to open up the lock at the top of the stairs. So it was kind of like he knew. He was like, well, you're at home. Like, there's no napping. Like, my older one already had stopped napping at that point. And he was like, oh, I thought we were going to have time together when he naps. He was like five. But um, so it really kind of changed. Yeah, it kind of changed how I worked. And now they are 14 and 17, and they're like, you know, not as involved in it, but when, when they were younger too, like they would, you know, are you sewing? They're staring over my shoulder. They're, you know, everything can be touched because they were, it was all touched by them. Like they're dependent on it, but yeah, it's definitely. So I feel like there was kind of a gift of me being able, I never could have allowed myself the freedom not to work full time without having kids. But then, you know, having them is a whole other set of, so I don't, um, my house is messy. I think if your mother told me, like, don't worry about your house being messy. If you spend your time cleaning, you're doing the wrong thing. So no one ever regrets having, um, no one ever says, I wish I'd cleaned more. So I, you know, so it's a lot of, I know, does that kind of answer your question? Because you have a little one, don't you? you have a, <laughs> but yeah, it gets easy, you know, like, you kind of work in, like, when they're napping or when they're, like, happily occupied for a little while and you're doing stuff. And the next thing you know, they're in school and you're, like, and then, you know, they're like driving and then they're like looking at colleges and, you know, um, and then you realize you have a lot more time, but a different kind of time because it doesn't get easier. It just gets like different as they get older. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's different, but. Oh, I never have a sketch to begin with. No, I never draw to begin with. No, I usually don't though because it's. Yeah. Yeah. After. Yeah, they're after. They're like little portraits after they're done. I rarely. I rarely draw anything else out unless I need it, like for a technical reason. 
Like if I need it, like with that book bed, if I needed to know measurements and I needed to know how much lumber to get or I needed to know something specific. Otherwise, I'm not usually drawing it out beforehand. I've got the materials in my hand and I'm looking at the materials and I'm looking at the piece and then I'm looking like, I need this, I need something like that. Or I go, and then I go to the thrift store and I'm like, oh, I need a navy blue dress. And I look and I find one maybe or, or I don't or I find this little girl's flowery dress and I think that's perfect. I don't know what it's perfect for yet, <laughs> but it'll be good for something. Or that navy blue gumball dress. I've got that like three years ago. I had no idea what I was using it for, but it was like 99 cents. I'm at St. Vincent de Paul and Corey all the time, and I'm like, oh, you know what, it, I could use it for, I don't know, but it feels like it could be something, so I take it home, and then it goes kind of in a little stash. And then I knew, I, sometimes I know, actually when I do write, it's words. So like when I was planning out those little houses, I'm putting like, you know, what words do I want to have in there? And I'm thinking, I want to make it mean this. So then I'm writing like 10 words, 15 words, and I narrow it down to like where the meaning is. So it's definitely like, I'll, I'll write when it's about language or it's technical planning, but I don't usually draw it or plan out anything. I don't know if that's, I don't know if, and I, maybe that's why, like for so many years I was, you know, and in college I was like, I don't think I'm really an artist because I'm not really drawing or painting, but um, it's just a different process, right? So I know, I know, but it's, you know, it's that traditional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to you. No, it's, you know, and. So yeah, my concentration was in metal smithing and I don't really do any of it anymore, but it's still handy to know how to do it and use a little, like when I was cutting out all those little silhouettes in wood, I used my little saw and it was really easy because I knew how to make, you know, I knew how to hold the blade and make it work. But um, yeah, any other questions? Does that kind of answer? So up until a year ago, I was working in random places in my house and driving my whole family crazy and um, we built a garage during, during COVID 2020, and I have a big space above the garage now. It's like 12 foot by 30 feet, and it's nice, and it's got like a little mini split, so it's cool and heated, and, but it's the first time I've ever had space, you know, and I'm, I've never had space like that. You remember when you came? Yeah. Because uh -uh. we had this little tiny, I had this nine by 10 room, and then I lost it because my husband needed an office at home. So I got kicked out of there. So like it was just, um, and he's like, you know, he made it up to me a few years later and built me this giant space. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. They might. Um, I ended up in the right right before COVID. I got a ten by ten storage space because I was worried about like. I didn't really have a good place to store them in the house. They were kind of all along this one hallway where the boys' rooms were. And I was like, I don't know how well this is going to work in the long run. So I splurged and got this storage place. And um, I mean, some of the paper is going to deteriorate. And you can see like how that cookbook skirt is like really aging and yellowing it. But it's cheap paper too. Like those aren't made like quality wise, depending on what books I use and what um, some of the fabric. Yeah, over time for sure. Yeah, they might, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it not being some permanent thing that lasts forever. I'm not carving anything in stone. I'm not casting things in, you know, in bronze or anything. So I'm okay with it being like our fleeting little lives, right? So 